So continuing to read through the work of Solomon and through the Proverbs and then just most recently into the Song of Songs and just doing a little bit of thinking about what we encounter there and then beyond that into life today and church today. Now Song of Songs is a totally unique book in the scriptures. It seems to be the sort of poetry of love and sort of romantic, erotic engagement between the lover and the beloved and they're being cheered on by their friends in the background who have these great little anthem moments to to keep them on the right track. And it's been a bit of a conundrum for interpreters, biblical interpreters throughout history. So I don't really want to get into all the different options of how to handle Song of Songs, but I just want to make one specific observation through a little series of steps. So one way of reading Song of Songs is symbolic or analogical and this was really favoured by the Puritans who were really quite uncomfortable with the graphic nature of some of the text. And so they said this isn't really about two human beings in love in bed. This is about the love between God and humanity and in particular Christ and the church. And so Solomon is somehow mysteriously able to anticipate Christ and the church and weave that into the poetry of Song of Songs. Now I find this interpretation pretty far-fetched but there is a theological logic to it with interpretation and inference so let's do that just for a minute. In Ephesians chapter 5 when Paul is writing about the love of a husband and a wife he actually seamlessly moves in to say in the next breath actually I'm also talking or I'm really talking about the love between Christ and the church as a husband and a wife. And so there's this interwoven relational dimension to it that Paul seems very comfortable with. And so through interpretive inference, you could say therefore, something of what's going on in Song of Songs can be alluded to Christ and the church if it is about the lover and the beloved. Not that Solomon knew that that was going on at the time, he wasn't uh, projecting something into the future, but we can look back and gain some sort of insight from it in light of Paul's theology. Now one of the things that I guess perplexes me and is somewhat ironic is when we also read some of Paul's text about the church in Galatians chapter 3, when Paul talks about the church and he says, now within Christ there is now no longer Jew nor Gentile slave nor free, male nor female. So he takes these different, very established social divisions and says these divisions are now null and void in Christ, in the church. All these divisions that used to separate us and make us distinct and make us and, and, and categorize us in a particular way, they are now no longer legitimate when we are in Christ. There is no longer Jew nor Gentile, male nor female, slave nor free. So Paul here is bringing us together to be in union, to be one with each other, just like the high priestly prayer of Jesus in John chapters 15 and 16, where we are prayed into unity, just as the Father and Christ are one, so we also would be one. So the irony for me is that in modern day church reality, we have an almost infinite number of denominations. And denominations are built around their distinctives. They have these things called statements of faith. And statements of faith are the articulated doctrine that makes one denomination distinct from other denominations. Uh, it is a reinforcement of difference. Now this seems to me to be somewhat counterproductive and even counterintuitive when we're encountering the gospel that we would deliberately try and reinforce our differences instead of trying to articulate that which brings us into union. And that's why I prefer creedal statements, the great creeds of Christian history rather than perhaps statements of faith. The intention of the creeds, going right back to the earliest of the great creeds, the Nicene Creed, which was the first great ecumenical council and penned primarily through Athanasius but also a whole conglomerate of bishops from all over the, the Roman Empire at the time. 
the, the intention of that creed was to articulate something as broad as possible and as accurately as possible to unify as many people as possible. So it wasn't about articulating distinctives, it was about articulating that which brings us into union, the truth which holds us all together. That is creedal Christianity. Denominational Christianity actually does something quite different because it articulates and reinforces our differences rather than what is the cause of our union in Christ. So that's not to say the church, the modern church, is legitimate or is bad or wrong or any way like that, not at all. But I do think sometimes if our emphasis is more upon either the buildings that we meet in or the brand of the denomination that we have a particular um, allegiance to, then we can miss something of the grandness and the beauty and the complexity and the variety of the union of the body of Christ, the children of God, that transcends all of those denominations and all of those doctrinal distinctives and we are held together under the banner of a grand truth. And that brings us back to the Song of Solomon where we're told that the lover takes the beloved into the banqueting house and is seated at the table and his banner over us is love. So there's this unifying banner that holds us all together. So a few miscellaneous thoughts that spring to us from the Song of Solomon that hopefully call us back to paying attention to that which unifies us in Christ. Till next time. Peace.